seen experiment at all. So the story starts here with the source of H minus ions. What do you think of H minus ion is? Hydrogen. Or proton. Uh, what's the charge on the proton? No, it's not an antiproton. It's a, it's a proton plus two electrons. Ah, which right. is uh, something I know about to like it. Um, uh, anyway, these H minus ions get injected into a linear accelerator here. And the ion source is actually somewhere through this wall, just to give you a bearings. So the H minus ions get initial acceleration down here up to, I think it's about 70 mega electron volts. And then the H minus ions get in injected into the synchrotron ring. But there's a trick which is done at the point of injection. H minus ions pass through a stripping foil, and this is a it's a piece of alumina about this size, but it's very very thin, so thin you can see through it. Um, so the, the particles pass through it, but it strips off the electrons. So at that point, the the H minus ions lose their electrons, and then they become what do you get? If protons. You, yeah, it's protons. <laughs> uh, so at the point, once they're in the ring. Uh, the particles and their protons. This 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 stripping trick uh, is basically done so that the H minus ions are attracted to what's already in the ring. <laughs> so instead of them being repelled by what's in the ring, they're attracted so you can get more in. Um, then you've got protons in the ring. Once you've filled it up, you accelerate them to higher energy to about 800 mega electron volts. And then once they got to that energy, you extract them. They'll be extracted down here like that, and that's how we get protons out from making neutrons. They're actually extracted down here uh, 50 times a second. Well, they would be if we only had target station one, which is we, what we originally had. Um, we now have two target stations, the second one here, which is much newer, and we'll see later on. So, what we actually do is we extract four pulses down here, and then one pulse down into target station two four down here and so on. So instead of 50 a second we now get 40 a second down here. We use the protons to make neutrons. So we have a target here or here in target station 2 and inside that target station uh, there's, there's a target and that is uh, made of metal, tantalum or tungsten usually. Uh, it's actually a series of metal plates with cooling water rushing between because the proton beam deposits a lot of heat into that target. And then the neutrons are made when the protons hit the target by something called spallation. It's, it's actually an old word. I, I think it comes from masonry. If you have a stone uh, and you, you chip away at it, bits fly off, don't they? Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're making a, trying to trim a stone into a square brick or something. Right. Bits fly off, and it's the same that happens here in a sense. The protons knock bits off the nuclei in the target, uh -huh. and that's how we get our neutrons. Uh, we get about 15 neutrons for every proton that goes in. It's very crucial to the reaction. Anyway, these neutrons, uh, because they've been produced by this process where protons of 800 mega electron volts come in, they are very energetic. And that's not actually any good for our experiments. Uh, for our experiments, we need much uh, less energetic neutrons. We need the neutron wavelength to be about the same as interatomic spacings, which is uh, about one angstrom, if you know what an angstrom is. Do you know what an angstrom is? 10 to the minus 10. Exactly. Right. It's a non SI unit, but it's very convenient for diffraction. Right. Also, for doing spectroscopy, you need the neutron energy to be similar to thermal energies, which uh, room temperature is equivalent to 25 milli electron volts. That's another non SI unit, which is very convenient for us. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that a, a thermal neutron, one whose energy is of order 25 milli volts, also has the right wavelength of order one angstrom. Um, so we need neutrons of energy in, in the ballpark of 25 milli electron volts. Whereas 
the neutrons as created, their energy can be anything up to the 800 mega electron volts of the incoming proton. So we've got to get a lot of energy out of the neutrons. So what we do is we have a device called a moderator. And you can think of it as being like a bucket of water, basically. Um, we put this bucket of water very close to the target. Uh, neutrons to go in the right direction go into the moderator. And they undergo lots of collisions with, with the, the water. And they, they tend to lose energy and get slowed down. So they take on the characteristic temperature of the moderator, which, which is an order of temperature. So that's how we slow them down. The reason I say water is because water, uh, we actually have three moderators. One of them does contain the water at room temperature. The others contain liquid methane and liquid hydrogen. Um, the reason we use those materials is they all contain a lot of hydrogen. If you do uh, the equations for the collision between two balls, you get the biggest energy transfer if the balls have the same mass. And hydrogen and neutrons have, or proton and neutrons have almost the same mass, as you probably know. So moderators that contain lots of hydrogen are best. Right? So that's how we make the neutrons. Now, as I was telling you, we, we fire the beam down here at 50 times a second or 40 times a second. So it's a pulse beam, it's not continuous. So the protons make the neutrons, and the process of making them and slowing them down is actually very quick. Uh, so all the neutrons we've made effectively leave the target at almost exactly the same time. And then they take time to travel along the beam lines to where the experiment is done. We produce not just one wavelength or energy of neutrons, but a, a wide distribution. So neutrons of different energy take different times to travel down the beam line. So if we record the time of arrival of a neutron when we detect it, we can use what's called the time of flight technique, uh, which is very, very simple maths. You know, uh, the velocity is uh, di distance over time. Uh, so we can work out the velocity of the neutron from its time of arrival, assuming we know the distance, which we do. Uh, so we can work out its velocity or its wavelength or its energy by this time of flight technique. So if we do diffraction, it's different to doing laboratory X-ray diffraction, where you monochromate the beam. Um, so there are differences because of the different technique. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? You do get a byproduct as well, of all this, which is muons. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. So you've got so that. Yeah. Like another target. That's here, right. There is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Muons are not my field. I've never done a muon experiment, so I know less about them. But uh, way, the way it works is in here there's a, a secondary target, which is a piece of carbon. And the muons are produced from that target. And one thing about muons is whereas neutrons, as their name says, are neutral, mm -hmm. once you've made them, you have very little control over them because they have no charge. Okay. The muons have a charge means we can use magnetic fields to, to make the beam go around the corners and, and do various things with it. So you'll see these beams, which are muon beams, are not straight. Um, so the muon comes along and you implant it into a sample. But the, there are a couple of special properties about this. The muons produced by this method are very highly polarised. So muons have a magnetic moment they're like a tiny little magnet. Uh, but it's a highly polarised beam, so they're all pointing more or less the same way. And they come to rest at some particular site in your sample. And then they sit there on that site and they experience the local magnetic field in that site in the material. So that their moment actually processes about that magnetic field. <laughs> Similar to. <laughs> a lot of the early workers with muons were in fact sort of migrants from the NMR field. So anyway, <laughs> muon is a radioactive particle. It doesn't live forever. It actually lives a very short time. I don't remember how long. Uh, but when it decays, it kicks out a positron. And so what we actually detect is the positron from its decay. So if you've got a sample with muons implanted in it and you detect the positrons, you see a radioactive decay. 
So how do they detect the positrons without it decaying with something else, Just like decaying with an, with an electron? Well, you buy a, a, a familiar battery, isn't it?